All right, here's the problem. A lot of people think that Joseph's story and other books in the Old Testament, other stories, were just allegorical to to show us something, to teach us a a good thing with morals and, and how to be kind to people. But Joseph was a real person in history. And archaeology, my friend, archaeology has proven that he is real. We're going to take a look at that right now. So, this is a coin, okay? That's a coin that was found in 2009 in Egypt. Um, It was reported by the Al Haram newspaper and the Jerusalem Post. And what it was, was they had a boxes of boxes of artifacts from digs from years and years ago, and they found these coins. And what you see there in the top left, as, as you're looking at it right up there, what you're seeing is a picture of, of Joseph. They're saying that that was his portrait. It even had his name on some of these coins, it says. And as you can see, I did a little drawing underneath on the chalkboard, this picture is not your typical Egyptian looking man. This this guy looks like Hebrew, right? He looks very Hebrew in appearance for what they would have looked like. The curly hair, the typical, the beard, um, you know, it almost looks like he's King David or something in that picture. Well, they believe that this was in fact Joseph, Old Testament Joseph. And it even said that uh, some of the coins bared his, for his name, in the year that he was under the Pharaoh and which Pharaoh he was under. So you can look into that some more on your own, but it was just really interesting. And Joseph was a real guy. There was another archaeological find where they found, and I think it was like 1000 BC before Christ, where they found this rock and and the rock had uh, engraving, the the words engraved in it, talking about uh, this man who told the Pharaoh about a great harvest and then a great famine, a seven-year famine, how he saved all of Egypt. I mean, who else could this be? So the Bible is always true, my friend. The Bible proves truth. And even the best archaeologists in the world today, they use the Bible to help them with their archaeology. I think it's really interesting. All right. All right. So let's take a look at a timeline here as we get started, as we're going to go through Genesis chapter 40 and 41. And my favorite, favorite person in the Old Testament in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible written by Moses, my favorite guy, Joseph. And if you're in Israel, it's Yosef. And it's just awesome because (laughs) Joseph's story shows us a clear picture of the Messiah and how he saves the whole world. Hi, my name is George Crabb. Welcome to my channel. And uh, you're going to see, you're going to gain valuable knowledge and you're going to see how Joseph, Old Testament Joseph, was a picture and a type and a basically a painting of Jesus Christ, Yeshua, the Messiah. And you're going to see that clearly in this video and gain valuable insight into it. All right. So here's the timeline. As you can see right down here is BC, which means before Christ. And we can see that in the beginning, there was God. He was in the beginning. You can't go back any further than that. You know, those are the first words of the Bible in the beginning. Elohim, which is God, right? And then further on, we see that there was uh, Adam and Eve and the flood. And then we see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then Jacob's son, his favored son, the 11th born son of Israel, Joseph or Yosef. And Joseph was right around 2000 BC, uh, maybe 1900 BC, and then later on around 1400. We're not sure on these dates exactly, but we see Moses. And then later on about 1000 BC, we have a pretty good date there. We see David. And then later on around 600 to 500, we see Daniel, Zechariah. And then there was 400 years of silence. There wasn't any prophecy. And then we see 0 AD and the birth of Jesus, as Isaiah says, Isaiah chapter 7 says that a virgin shall conceive a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And also in Isaiah chapter 9, unto us a son is born, 
uh, unto us, you know, and it says that his name shall be Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Speaking of the Messiah, my friends, and you guys know that Isaiah 53 is a clear picture of the suffering that Jesus uh, had on the cross. And we know that Psalm 22, same thing. David had that prophetic psalm about Jesus on the cross where they mocked him and they stripped him of his, they were casting lots for his tunic, right? And we're going to see a little bit of that in this episode, you guys. All right. Without further ado, let's get into the scripture. We always want to get right into the scripture. Very important. And before we go into chapter 40, I want to review just a little bit of what we went through in chapters 37 and uh, 39 in Joseph's story. So um, if you remember in Genesis chapter 37, verse 23, it says, So it came to pass that when Joseph had come to his brothers, that they stripped him of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. And a lot of scholars and archaeologists and you know historians, they believe that this tunic of many colors was actually a long-sleeved and a long down-to-the-ankles tunic. It was a full-sized, uh, you know, tunic and possibly even a tunic of, you know, woven from one piece of fabric. And it held, a lot of times, a lot of scholars believe that it held scrolls in the sleeves. Possibly there was pockets in there and writing utensils. Um, so that's what we see there. So also, when Jesus was being mocked, spat on, um, and persecuted and beaten and scourged, they uh, look at what they did to him just before he was crucified, just before he was crucified. It says in Matthew chapter 27 that, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And John records that they, they stripped him of his tunic and that the soldiers divided up his garments in, in four pieces. So those are the outer garments. They were dividing up into four pieces. But then it says that they didn't want to rip his, his tunic, which is the one that he wore underneath the tunic, which was wolf from, woven from one piece of thread. It was one, there was no seams. It was a seamless tunic. And it says that they cast lots. John recorded they cast lots for his clothing. Psalm 22 says, they cast lots for my clothing. It was like David was looking down through the eyes of Jesus. So this stuff was written, th David wrote that 1,000 years before Christ. This stuff was thousands of years, some of it, before Jesus was even born. This is amazing, you guys. So they took Joseph's tunic, chapter 37 of Genesis. They took Joseph's tunic, killed a kid of the goats. This is what his brothers were doing. And they dipped the tunic in blood. Very interesting, right? So now look at the picture John saw in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. And it says in that book, uh, this is about the second coming of, of Christ, of the Messiah. It says that he was clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And that's Revelation chapter 19, verse 13. Isn't that amazing? And later on, we're going to see that Pharaoh, he who sat on the throne, after he raises Joseph up out of that place of the condemned, that pit, as it's called, and it says that he named him Zaph Zaphonach Paneach, okay? And that means God speaks like the word of God, and he lives. That's what his name means. It means some other things too, and we're going to look at that a little bit later, and you're going to be blown away by it, you guys. So this is highly significant as it shows us that it's all being done for the atonement of sins. And Ezekiel even shows us in Ezekiel chapter 43, it says, On the second day you shall offer a kid of the goats without blemish for a sin offering. So Joseph's goat being dipped in the goat's, his, his tunic being dipped in the, the goat's blood by his brothers is a picture of the atonement for sins. And it's so good, you guys. This is amazing. Oh, my goodness. Hey, by the way, I'm going to be preaching in person on June 20th of 2021 this year. And it's Father's Day, and I have a special Father's Day message. And uh, you can check it out at Dungeness Community Church. Okay, you can go to the YouTube channel, you can watch it live stream, or if you're around the area, come on over and watch. Um, I'd love to meet you, but yeah, check it out. It's going to be a special Father's Day uh, message, and I think you'll enjoy it. So 
All right, you guys. So let's um, let's move on with the rest of the scriptures. Also, I want to look at Psalm 105 before we go into this book of Genesis, uh, into the story of Joseph here. So Psalm 105 says that they he sent a man before them, Joseph, right? And who was sold as a slave. And it says in the scripture that they hurt his feet with fetters and he was laid in irons. In some scripture even says he had an iron collar about his neck. So this pit, this dungeon, this place of the condemned that he was falsely accused. Remember in the last chapter, he was falsely accused. And then this Potiphar person, this captain of the guard, who was a Pontius Pilate type, had him put in this place of the condemned. And this was not a nice place, you guys. Even though Joseph was in charge of it, it was not a good place. And Joseph was down here. He was separated from his father and his family. This must have been the lowest point of Joseph's life, as we can imagine. And then in Psalm 88, it says that, O Lord, God, my salvation, I have cried out day by night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to the grave, and I am counted with those who go down to the pit. You see the pictures in here? There's so much of this, you guys. And then remember in chapter 39, it says, And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. And whatever they did there, whatever they did there, it was his doing, Joseph's doing. And the keeper of the prison did not look into anything, the scripture says, into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it to prosper. And that's Genesis chapter 39. So we see in Revelation again, here's Jesus again. Now watch this. John penned it, what Jesus is saying. He says, I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. You see the picture? Jesus is in charge of the place of the condemned. He's in charge of it all, my friend, all of it. And that was in Revelation 118 where John penned that. So it's just amazing what we're seeing here, you guys. All right, so let's get into the scripture. Um, so chapter 40 of Genesis, the book of beginnings. Here we go. Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against the Lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. And he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. And the captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them. And he attended them, and they continued for some time in custody. And one night, they both dreamed. The cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt were confined in the prison, each, each his own dream, and each dream with its own interpretation. So they, here we see Joseph, a type of Jesus, in this place of the condemned, put there by this captain of the guard. And then two come to be with him. Remember, Jesus was on the cross, and there were two condemned with him, right? Two. Think about that as we go through this. Ready? This is good. So, and when Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in, in his master's house, why are your faces so downcast today? And they said to him, we have had dreams, and there is none to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell them to me. Oh, <laughs> this is going to be good. And the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said, in my dream there was a vine before me, and on the vine there were three branches. As soon as it budded, its blossoms shot forth, and the clusters ripened into grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, 
And I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, this is the interpretation. The three branches are three days. How many days was Jesus dead? Oh, that's right. Three days, right? Three days. And then verse 14, only remember me, Joseph says to him, when it is well with you. Oh, I'm sorry. We, we skipped this. Verse 13, in three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. And then he says to him, only remember me when it is well with you, and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. So what we're seeing here, you guys, is when Jesus was on that cross, and that one criminal, there was two on both sides of him, and they both started out mocking him. If you read Matthew carefully, they both reviled him and mocked him just like the Pharisees and the religious leaders did. But then one of them has a change of heart. And he tells the other criminal, stop it. He says, we deserve what we're getting here. And so he's admitting that he's a sinner, that he deserves what he's getting. And then he turns his eyes to Jesus. That's a form of repentance, turning our eyes to God, to Jesus. And he says to him, Lord, calls him Lord, remember me in your kingdom. And then Jesus looks at him and says, today you will be with me in paradise. Whoa, that guy was saved, my friend, by believing. There wasn't any good work he can do. He couldn't get down from that cross and get baptized or do any good work, but he was saved right on the spot because he believed in Jesus. And that's what we're seeing here, you guys. So, so in three days, this guy gets restored to the, to the throne to serve he who sat on the throne. He gets to be restored and he's going to live. That's what we're seeing. And Joseph tells him that. And then Joseph tells him to remember me. Remember the criminal said to Jesus, remember me. So there's so much in this, you guys. And then verse 15, For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that, I sh that they should put me in this pit. So he's down in this pit, you guys, down in this dark, rancid pit. And I've read up a little bit on these uh, prisons in Egypt in ancient times, and they were cold, dark, smelly. There was no sewer system. They were rancid. This was not a good place to be. And they were down in, in, under the ground like a pit. So, and remember Jesus said, just as Jonah will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, so will the Son of Man be three days or in the, in the belly of that great fish about Jonah. He said, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. Mm -hmm. You know, it's real interesting to me. When Jesus died on that cross, there was an earthquake so powerful that Matthew records that the rocks were splitting. And I've studied this a little bit in geography, in college, a little bit of uh, world geography. And when rocks, when there's an earthquake of like a 9.5 and above magnitude, rocks will, will shatter. They'll break in half, they'll shatter. And it's even recorded that right around the first century, the first part of the first century, there was a massive, massive earthquake that went all the way up the African Rift Valley, up through the Red Sea, up to the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee, all the way up into Syria and beyond. And it was a massive, massive earthquake. I believe that was the earthquake when Jesus died on the cross. When my professor said it was right around the first part of the first century, immediately I was thinking of the earthquake when Jesus died. And everyone around him was like, surely this was the Son of God. They were scared. There were some powerful, crazy things happening when Jesus died. Like it was dark for three hours, just suddenly dark. And then it was light and he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Taking everyone to Psalm 22. And we're going to get into that later, you guys. All right, let's get back to the story here. So, so Joseph interprets the cupbearer's dream. He's restored to live, to be with the king. That's the picture of the one criminal on the cross who was saved. And then verse 16, And when the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream, and there were three baskets on my head. And in the uppermost basket there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating it 
out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation of uh, the interpretation. The three baskets are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift your head up from you. Uh Uh-oh, it gets bad here. And hang you on a tree and the birds will eat the flesh from you. That's not good. In Revelation, it says that the enemies of Jesus Christ, when he comes back in his second coming as a great warrior and king, that the enemies that were that are coming against Israel, they're coming against the, the believers in Jesus, the saints, that he will wipe them out, and it says that the birds will eat of them. They will be cursed, and the birds will eat of their flesh. So again, we're seeing the tie-in here with the Bible. The Bible is the best commentary for the Bible, you guys. So this guy didn't get a good, you know, there was two on both sides of Jesus. Only one confessed. And I believe this is a picture of the other one. And that's also a picture of all of us, you guys, because we are all guaranteed to die. We all have a certificate of death unless Jesus comes back first. And you want to make sure that you are like the other who is saved, that you you receive Christ, that you believe in him, that you know you're a sinner, you call him Lord and your Savior. You want to do that now. <laughs> and you'll have an opportunity to do that at the end of this video. So uh, hang in there. It's a prayer to God where you receive him and you are born again. All right. So verse 20. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all of the servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. And he restored the chief cupbearer to his position, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker, as Joseph had interpreted to them. And yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but he forgot him. Mm, Poor Joseph. All right. So chapter 41 starts this way. And after the two whole years... After two whole years, Joseph was down there another two years. This guy went through so much. Ah, poor Joseph. So after two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. And behold, there came up from uh, out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump, and they fed in in the reed grass. And behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin, came up out of the Nile after them and stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly, thin cows ate up the seven attractive, plump cows, and Pharaoh awoke. And he fell asleep and dreamed a second time, and behold, the ears of grain, plump and good, were growing on one stalk. And behold, after them sprouted seven ears, thin and blighted by the east wind. By the way, when they had east winds in those days, and in, in even today in Egypt and in the Middle East, that's a hot, dry, blighting wind that comes from the Arabian desert, and it just burns up everything. The vegetation, uh, it's, it was a, this is how they had a lot of the great famines in those days. And in verse 7, it says, And the thin ears swallowed up the plump, the seven plump full ears. And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. So in the morning his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and its wise men. And jo- and, excuse me, and Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. Now, in the book of Revelation, John sees a vision. And he's in heaven. There's the throne. He who sat on the throne had scrolls in his hand. And it says that no one was found worthy to take the scrolls out of the right hand of he who sat on the throne. And John wept. But an elder sees John and he says, don't weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah has been found worthy. And then it says that John saw a lamb as if he had been slain. And he takes the scrolls out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. You see, my friend, only Jesus is found worthy to take the scrolls. And in this story, Joseph, which he's a picture of the greater Jesus Christ, 
he was the only one found worthy to interpret these dreams. You're going to see that right here. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, I remember my offenses today. And when Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me and the chief baker in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, we dreamed on the same night, he and I, each having a dream with its own interpretation. And a young Hebrew was with us there, a servant of the captain of the guard. And when he told, when we told him, he interpreted our dreams to us giving an interpretation to each man according to his dream. <laughs> and he interpreted it to us, so it came about. I was restored to my office, and the baker was hanged. And when Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, so then, okay, this is where it gets great, you guys. I'm going to highlight this because this is very powerful. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they quickly brought him out of the pit. Up and out of the pit, you guys. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. When Jesus was resurrected after three days and he was resurrected from the dead, Jesus went to the right hand of the Father. Remember, Mary Magdalene came to the grave first. She was the first person to see Jesus. By the way, it was a woman, isn't that awesome, who saw Jesus first. And when she went in, there was an angel on both sides of the place where Jesus' body was laying. An angel on both sides in that, that tomb. It was a, a grave that Joseph of Arimathea, a righteous man, gave to Jesus for his, his body. And it was a grave that had never been occupied by anybody else. There was never a dead body in there. And it was hewn from solid rock. Okay? Get this picture. So there's probably a flat spot and two angels on both sides. Do you guys know the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat of pure gold, has two angels on both sides with the wings touching. And the mercy seat, you guys, is the place where the Lord sat. Remember in the tabernacle? The Lord sat there and it was sprinkled with blood by the high priest. And it was the mercy seat. Jesus sat up in the mercy seat as the angels were there. And Mary Magdalene got to see Jesus first when he was resurrected from the dead. And then he went up to the right hand of the Father. Remember that? Before she can touch him. Or he, she was clinging to him. He says, don't cling to me. I still need to, to go to my Father first. And he did. But here, check this out. So Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they quickly brought him up out of the pit. Oh, my. This is so good, you guys. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said that, uh, that of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And I love this answer that Joseph gave him. Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. And the footnote says, it's comparing the Samaritan Septuagint, and it says that... Um, Without God, it is not possible to give Pharaoh an answer about his welfare. All right? And then verse 17. So then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, in my dream, I was standing on the banks of the Nile River, and seven cows, plump and attractive, came up out of the Nile to and fed in the reed grass. And seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and thin, and such as I had never seen in all the land of Egypt, and the thin, ugly cows. So he goes into his dreams. I'm going to skip ahead here because it's kind of repetitive, but he's going into the same thing that he saw. He's telling Joseph about his dream. And then Joseph answers in verse 25. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are the seven years. The dreams are one. And the seven uh, lean and ugly cows that came up after them are the seven years, and the seven empty ears blighted by the east wind are the seven years of famine. It is as I told Pharaoh, God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. And there will come seven years of great plenty throughout the land of Egypt. So like a great harvest, you guys. But after them, there will be 
there will arise seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine will consume the land. And the plenty will be unknown in the land by reason of the famine that will follow, for it will be very severe. So this speaks of a time of great trouble, is what he's talking about. And the and the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed by God, and God will shortly bring it to uh, bring it about. And now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man, and let and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years. And let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are going to occur in the land of Egypt so that the land may not perish through the famine. The proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this in whom is the Spirit of God? Oh, wow, you guys. Or it says God's, but I like that. The Spirit of God. Can we find a man like this? And then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house And all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards to the throne will I be greater than you. And that footnote says, according to your command, and my people shall kiss the ground. Wow, doesn't this speak of the Lord? And then verse 41, And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand, and he put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. My, oh my, you guys, this right here is in Revelation, okay? In Revelation chapter 1, we see Jesus clothed in fine linen. It says he's in a in a tunic, a Uh, down to his ankles, and it says that he has a gold band about him, a gold band, and here we see a gold chain about his neck on Joseph. We're seeing the same picture, you guys. And then verse 43, and he made him ride in his second chariot, and they called out before him, bow the knee, and thus he set him over the land of Egypt. And I believe the Hebrew word here for bow the knee, it says it sounds similar to the meaning of it's a, a brek, a brek which is, is bow down or bow the knee down. And then verse 44, Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no one shall lift up a hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphnach, Haneach, and he gave him in marriage to Asenath, the, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. So Joseph went, on, went out over the land of Egypt. So this one right here we need to look at. Pharaoh gives him a new name, and it's Zaphnath, Zaphnach Haneach, okay? And I looked that name up, you guys, and this is going to blow you away, all right? It's actually, um, it's actually in my book I wrote on Joseph because it goes into, this book goes into a lot of detail. Um, you know, you can't really see it there, but a lot of detail about Joseph. And in this book, I found uh, doing research where it says, you guys, check this out. It says that Pharaoh, okay, so Pharaoh also gave him a new name, Zaphnach Panech, uh, which some interpretations give it the meaning God speaks and he lives. God speaks and he lives is a, is a meaning of that name. Also, uh, it's another way of saying the word of God. Remember, Jesus is called the word of God. God speaks and he lives. 
And by the way, remember, this is Pharaoh's birthday. So he who sat on the throne, this was his birthday. Well, Jesus, when he was raised from the dead, it was like a new birth for all of us. And it was like a birthday. When you're born again to God, it's an actual new birth, a spiritual birth where you're going to live forever and start a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, you guys. All right, and another name for this Zafnaf Panech is a revealer of secrets. So it's like him taking the scrolls out of the right hand of he who sat on the throne. It also means the salvation or savior of the world. Wow. And then it also means the sustainer of the age, like the thousand-year reign of Christ. Oh my goodness, this is so good, you guys. There's so much to the story of Joseph. I love this. Oh, and then he gives him a Gentile bride. He gives him a Gentile bride. Jesus right now has a Gentile bride, you guys, the church. And then verse uh, 46, Joseph was 30 years old when he entered into the service of Pharaoh the king. How old was Jesus when he went into service for God? He was, I mean, he was always serving God, but when he went into his ministry, which means service, he was 30 years old, the Bible says. Wow. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. During the seven plentiful years, the earth produced abundantly. And he gathered up all of the food for these seven years which occurred in the land of Egypt, and he put the food in the cities. He put in every city the food from the fields around it. And Joseph stored up grain in great abundance, like the sand of the sea, until he ceased to measure it, for it was not, for he could not measure it. It could not be measured, excuse me. Okay, let's look at that real quick. And Joseph stored up the grain in great abundance. You know that we are called the body of Christ as believers. And Jesus said that he is the bread of life, like the grain, so to speak. And we are like little grains, right? Little Christ. That's what Christians mean. The word Christians originally was a mocking term meaning little Christs. So we're little grains. And we are being harvested. God is harvesting the grain and bringing it into his storehouses, you guys, with his Gentile bride. You see the picture here, you guys? And what's amazing about this is in Revelation, it says that, that John says he sees a vision of people from every tribe, tongue, language, culture, and it, they were without number. Like the sands of the sea, they were, they were without number. And here we're seeing the same picture with this grain, you guys. Until he ceased to measure it, for it could not be measured. It couldn't be counted anymore. <laughs> this is so good, you guys. So before the year of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph. Um, and Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, bore them to him. So he has, through his Gentile bride, he has two sons born to him. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my hardship in all my father's house, making me forget. Mm, wow. And the name of the second uh, he called Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Ephraim means fruitful. That's a pretty awesome name. And the seven years of plenty that occurred in the land of Egypt came to an end, and the seven years of famine began to come. And Joseph had said, or as Joseph had said, and there was famine in all the lands. Wow, now it's changing from Egypt to all the lands. That's kind of an interesting uh, wording there. And there was famine in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt, there was bread. So they were okay where Joseph was. And where Jesus is, you will be okay as well. And then verse 55, then all the land of Egypt was famished and the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph, whatever he says you do. This is another one I want to highlight. Go to Joseph, whatever he says you do. A lot of people go to God. Okay, they cry out to God. God, save me, God. And God is saying to you, go to Jesus. 
Go to Jesus, what he says to you, do. The last words that we see recorded by Jesus' mother, Mary, were whatever he says, do. Whatever he says. Very interesting, you guys. And Pharaoh, he who sat on the throne, is telling them, don't go to me. You need to go to Joseph. God, the Father who sits on the throne, says you need to go to Jesus. You must be born again through Jesus Christ to see the kingdom of God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one goes to the Father except by me. That's what Jesus said. So then we're seeing a picture of that right there, guys. This is so amazing. And so when the famine had spread all uh, over all the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain, because the famine was severe over all the earth. This, to me, speaks of Jacob's trouble or the tribulation period spoken of by Daniel in Revelation, uh, many places in the Old Testament, speaking of Jacob's trouble, this, this time period where it's severe, it's a severe famine, but here it says it was severe over all the earth, you guys. There's coming a, a seven-year period, the Bible speaks about it, in Revelation and in Daniel and other places, where there's going to be a seven-year period where it's going to be horrible for over the whole world. The whole world is going to experience this. But if you're in Christ, you're the bride of Christ, like, uh, like Aseneth, his wife, his Gentile bride, she was in the palace with Joseph. She was being fed. She was taken care of with Joseph, you guys. He who was in charge of it all. And what's amazing about this story, you guys, is we're going to see God's plan through Joseph's life. We're going to see how he has a plan to save not only his Gentile bride, but his brothers who betrayed him and conspired to murder him many, many, many years ago, who thought he was long gone out of their lives. But they're going to find out that he's alive. Someday the Jewish people, Israel, they're going to see that their Messiah was Jesus and he's alive and he loves them and he will forgive them and show great mercy. If you read Zechariah, it says that they will look on him whom they pierced and they will mourn for him. They will also ask him, who put these wounds on your hands? Who did this to you? And he'll say, my friends did. The house of my friends. He's speaking about them. This is so good, you guys. God is so good. <laughs> I cannot believe how good God is and how he shows us these things. We get to see these things. Wow. All right, over here I did a, uh, you can see a picture of the, um, of what the, the grain silos look like. So there's a place called Saqqara, Egypt, where they a lot of scholars and archaeologists believe that this is where Joseph was, and they think he might have been this character named Imhotep. And um, what they found in Saqqara were these massive, massive uh, rectangular, and they go down very, very deep, like 70 feet deep silos for carrying grain. They even found some petrified grain in the bottom of these when they first discovered them. And what they did was it, it, there was a there was just a number of these big massive silos and they had like a tunnel system like a pipeline system where they would all drain by gravity into this one main silo okay and there was steps going from one entrance of this temple complex and there was like this one entrance and people had to walk in one way down to the bottom of this one silo there was like steps that went down and there was a hatch where they could get their portion of grain and then walk one way out okay so they'd walk out one way in one way out get their grain and this is what it looked like in this picture up here you can see that this is a this is kind of a rough drawing of what it was like you guys and they found this place in Saqqara, and they believe that that's where Joseph was because of these massive silos. And I believe it could have been. So it's kind of interesting. You can do your own research on that and check it out. It's pretty cool stuff, you guys. Really cool. So, all right. 
And behind me on that chalkboard, you can see it says Zaphnath Paneach, which is God speaks and he lives. And also he was called, another interpretation of that name is Savior of the World or uh, Sustainer of the Age. <laughs> this is so awesome what God did, you guys. Amazing stuff, you guys. And I'm going to go back to the baker and the cupbearer. Okay, the cupbearer was saved, the baker was not. Okay, I believe that just like the two criminals on both sides of Jesus, this is a picture of all of us, you guys. It's a picture of all of us. And what we see in that is that the cupbearer is a picture of that, that one criminal who understood that he was a sinner. And Jesus did not do anything wrong. He said that this man has done nothing wrong. And he turns his eyes to him and he says, Lord, remember me in your kingdom. And Jesus saved him. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. If you died today, where would you go? Do you have Jesus Christ in your heart? Do you want to be like the cupbearer restored to the king to drink? And it even means, I think the interpretation of that word for the cupbearer was actually like drinks. He drinks or it's water, it speaks of water, living water, you guys. He lives. And the baker, it speaks of, you know, he was cursed. The birds eat of his flesh. He's cursed. He's on that tree, which was a picture of cursing in the Old Testament. And he was baked forever, so to speak, you guys, because hell is a real place in the Bible. Jesus spoke much about it. The Bible speaks much about it. It's a place of burning, okay? Do you want to be baked forever like the baker? Or do you want to be serving the king in paradise, in the palace, drinking of the, the refreshing living water? And that only comes through Jesus Christ, you guys. He's the only way you can be saved. This is for all of us. Which will you be? Which one will you be? Will you choose? Which one do you want to choose to be? You have to make a choice. Everyone must make a choice for God. They must come to the cross and decide whether they're going to believe in Jesus and trust him as their Lord and Savior or reject him. This is a choice we all must make make. And if you would like to receive Jesus Christ into your heart, my friend, you can do so. He's a simple prayer away. He may be knocking on the door of your heart right now. You may feel something. You may not feel anything, but we go off of what the scriptures say, the word of God. And he says that if you confess with your mouth, it's in Romans, the Lord Jesus Christ and believe that he was raised from the dead, you will be saved, my friend. You will be born again to new life. Would you like to do that? If you would, you can just say this prayer right after me. You repeat the words after me. You are praying to God, not me, not anyone around you. This is a prayer between you and God, all right? You just repeat the words after me. You're praying from your heart to God. You're opening up your life to Jesus Christ, all right? All right, pray right after me. Dear God, I know that I am a sinner and I'm sorry for my sin. Please forgive me of my sin. Please help me to turn from my sin. I believe Jesus Christ came to this earth. I believe that he died on the cross and shed his blood for me. I also believe that in three days you raised him from the dead and that he is seated at the right hand of your throne. I want to follow Jesus as my Lord and my Savior from this day forward. Please help me to do that. I pray this in Jesus' name. A Man, oh, my friend, if you just prayed that prayer, congratulations, my friend. I did that at the age of 13, and there was a fire put in my heart, a fire of God's love. And I pray the Holy Spirit would fill you up, fill you up, and overflow you and refresh you. 
And that's what happened to me. I was filled with the Holy Spirit of God. It was like a, it's a new birth, a spiritual birth, believing in Jesus. You're going to heaven. Hey, congratulations on that. And I can't wait to go into the next episode of Joseph. There's much, much more. You're going to love it, you guys. I know it. And um, it's just so fun to look, to find Jesus in all of the Bible, to find Jesus in the Old Testament, where he's found, Jesus, uh, uh, all the types of him, Joseph being a type of Christ. This is so good. Hey, God bless you and God blessed his kingdom coming to this world.